really helped was the problem of getting the washing done. In the old days, it was a question of finding a stream and starting to scrub. But modern war is mechanized, and in the Canadian Army, even the laundry moves on wheels. This self-contained mobile unit can handle the laundry and blankets of some 4,000 men per week. The laundry can be set up anywhere and put into operation in about 45 minutes. All it needs is a stream or some other source of water supply. Even swamp water can be used, as it is purified automatically in the pumping system. Since the unit generates its own power, it can be used far from civilization. The mobile laundry, a part of the Royal Canadian Ordnance Corps, moves around from unit to unit in the field. While the troops are having a bath or a shower, their clothes are washed, dried, and returned to them within an hour. In addition, the laundry can be used to decontaminate clothing and equipment affected by blister gas. After being thoroughly washed in hot suds, the clothes are taken out and placed in the extractor. This whirls around at high speed and removes most of the water by centrifugal force. The clothes then pass from the extractor to the dryer. All the equipment is mounted on one truck. This type of mobile laundry is a Canadian development, worked out after experiment with various types of equipment. One such laundry is allotted to each division, with others for corps troops. Since the washing machine has gone to war, it's goodbye to Blue Monday. If only we didn't have to darn those socks. Two hundred small guests, carefully labeled so they wouldn't get lost before the day was over, arrived at the Christmas party held by the Canadian section of 2nd Echelon GHQ. It may not have been a white Christmas, but it was certainly a bright one for thousands of English kiddies living wherever Canadians were stationed. There were parties all through the Canadian Corps area. At the second echelon party, the visitors were all evacuees or children of prisoners of war, and they proved an appreciative audience for the day's entertainment. And it wasn't only the kids who liked the show. Santa Claus had a busy time, for under the huge Christmas tree, he had hundreds of parcels to distribute. The gifts were from personnel of Second Echelon, who also contributed their week's chocolate ration. Then there were candies and presents from an aircraft factory in central Ontario. It was a big day for the kids, and one that brought happiness and laughter to a lot of lonely little hearts. Hidden beneath the beard is CSM Pert of the Edmonton Regiment, which only goes to show that at Christmas time, even the heart of a sergeant major turns to gold. In this year's hockey opener, goals were cheap when headquarters 5th Div support group met up with the 17th Field Regiment. The Gunners, most of whom had played pretty good amateur hockey around their hometowns in Ontario, had too much on the puck. They laid down a heavy barrage and their aim was deadly. Maybe we shouldn't mention the final score, but just for the records, when the shooting was all over, the Gunners were on top by a score of 24 to nothing. The latest arrival of Canadians brought thousands more to swell the ranks of the still growing army. They were mostly reinforcements for all the various arms of the service and included a draft of Newfoundland Gunners for the Royal Artillery and Captain Ross Jung of Washington, D.C., a Chinese-American doctor with the RCAMC.
there were a lot of Air Force reinforcements and another draft of Canadian firefighters. Among the troops waiting on the platform for their trains was Private Tommy Fitzsimmons, RCOC, all the way from Great Slave Lake and Bill Gilling from Brandon, Manitoba. Private Struzer from Montreal and Greenberg from Ottawa. Lance Corporal Whitehead, Winnipeg, and Bernard Price, Gulf. You've got to be tough to take the new kind of war, and one of the jobs of the battle wing at CTS is to make the Canadian Army that way. The obstacle course plays its part in getting officers and men into prime condition, and it's no small part either. You can take it or leave it, but you can't leave it. You've just got to take it. now, Joe, or you'll be caught with them down. The mechanized might of the Canadian Army went on parade to mark the third anniversary of the landing of the first Canadians in England. Among General McNaughton's many guests were Mr. Meiske, the Russian ambassador, the Maharaja Jam, Mr. Vincent Massey, Sir James Griggs, Secretary of State for War, Major General Hartle, commanding the American forces in England, Air Vice Marshal Curtis, commanding the RCAF, and Captain Agnew, the Royal Canadian Navy in this country, and senior officers of the Canadian, British, Dominion, and Allied forces. Mr. Meiske showed particular interest in the Canadian-built and designed Ram tank, equal to any tank of its weight in the world. British officers, too, made a thorough examination. There were representative subunits of all the arms and services of the Canadian Army overseas. Practically all the vehicles, weapons, and equipment were produced in Canada and are a vivid reminder of the part played by the Canadian war industry in building the Canadian Army into a powerful striking force. In this war, as never before, armies depend on the industrial effort for their mobility, firepower, and maintenance. And in three bitter years of toil, sweat, and tears, Canada's phenomenal war industry has produced an enormous amount of first-class equipment, efficient and well-made, capable of standing the hard usage of the battlefield. These are indeed the tools of war. No matter how good the tools, it takes skilled workmen to use them. So it is only fitting for a parade of Canada's strength to finish with the infantry, the men whose success in battle depends upon the very human qualities of endurance and guts. 